Well, we're going, we're just taking six weeks to kind of do um, some two general themes of the Bible. Um, the first one being covenant that we talked about last week and, and this week being kingdom. And uh, covenant is about, remember, relationship, our relationship with God. And, and kingdom is about uh, living that out, about responsibility. And uh, as we begin this, I, I think of you know, John the Baptist and Jesus came and they said, the kingdom of God is at hand. And we might hear that and really not know, you know, what that's all about. Um, kingdom is used in, in the New Testament 163 times. Most of it is in the Gospels. Most of it comes from the mouth of Jesus. And um, I think it's a little difficult for us to, to process and in, interpret that because we as Americans have not experienced physically what it means to live in a kingdom. Uh, we might have lived in a movement, uh, been in a group. Kingdom is something that's just a little foreign to us. So um, king is, is not a familiar metaphor for Americans. And the Bible imagery of, of God as king uh, was God was the provider. Uh, he was the, the protector. And it's, it's quite different from us. So uh, when we say the word king, we, you know, most... Martin Luther King, uh, just getting through his birthday. And that's just a natural progression. If someone says king, that might be the first pay, uh, face that pops in our mind. Or if we're poker players, we might think of this guy, you know, a couple of kings, three kings, maybe uh, might be able to build a straight, uh, you know, with, with this. Or um, if we're blues people, it might be B.B., you know, B.B. King, all right? Uh, he and Lucille going at it there, you know, love B.B., or if you're a bad sports fan, you might think of LeBron James. You know, not exactly my favorite guy, as most of you know. If he is yours, I feel sorry for you. But anyway, <laughs> if none of those work, King, might, you might think of him. The weirdest guy in the world, Burger King, right? <laughs> right. What an image of King. I didn't help much with thinking of the King of, of, of the world, did I? I didn't, probably didn't improve your images of God as King very much. Um, but, um, you know, to get away from the language of king and kingdom, really what is meant by this, when we talk about the kingdom of God, is how we live out our covenant relationship. And last week on covenant, and just in case you weren't here or you were sleeping, remember when we talked about covenant, we were talking about, you know, how God promised that he would, in covenant with us, that, that we would be like the stars of the sky to Abraham, and that Everything that he had was ours. Everything that we have is his. But that was the covenant, and that's the relationship. But, you know, what does that mean? How does that live out in everyday life? And that's a kingdom issue. A kingdom is about how God uses us in his work and how we represent him in his work. So today we, we're going to look at the part of Joseph, um, Jacob's son. He's the 11th son of Jacob. Jacob was Abraham's grandson. So we're not too far removed from the original covenant to Abraham. And uh, I don't know if you like to track along, but it's in Genesis 7, or 30, excuse me, 37 is where we're going to start. I'm going to kind of tell the overview of the story. Uh, I think I'll get most parts, but uh, it's always good to, to look at it. And uh, so we start in Genesis 37, uh, just previous to this. Uh, God has come to Joseph, or excuse me, to Jacob, and he has reinstated, reaffirmed the, the covenant with, with his grandfather, Abraham, and even changes Jacob's name to Israel. Okay, he's sometimes called Jacob, sometimes called Israel. And he reinstates his covenant with him that he's going to make him a mighty nation. As a matter of fact, many nations are going to come from him. The same thing that he said really in essence to his grandfather. And Jacob had 12 sons uh, by two wives, uh, Leah and Rachel. Uh, they were sisters. Um, probably know that. I'm not going to retell that. But uh, the story uh, goes that Rachel is Jacob's love. He just is head over heels for Rachel, okay? And she is the dominant wife. She is the number one, 
you know, I don't know if you watch Sister Wives or not. That's a show on TV, right? It's about people that have more than one wife. It's kind of that kind of story. But this is the dominant one in, in, the, in the Sister Wives. And, but she's unable to have children. So that's a huge disadvantage. And, and Jacob has ten sons by Leah and by Rachel's maid. Okay? Until finally, Rachel has a son, and his name is Joseph. And then... Some years later, she dies bearing the 12th son, Benjamin. And that is the problem that Joseph, the 11th son, uh, uh, the first son by Rachel, the one that Jacob loves so much, uh, he gets the place in the family of the firstborn son, which was extremely important in their days to be firstborn. And it says in Genesis 37.3, uh, this line that just kind of catches us that Jacob loves Joseph more than the other sons. And we're going, oh, that's, that's not good. This, this isn't going to turn out well, and it doesn't. And he shows him this huge favoritism, you know. He, he gives him this famous beautiful coat, the multicolored coat. Some translations it's multicolored. Some translations it says with many ornaments. But what this coat means is important. Because it means that, that, that Jacob overlooks um, Joseph's ten older brothers. And Jacob the father chooses Joseph, the eleventh son, and gives the coat to him. And it's this coat that needs to be you know, taken care of. This is kind of like a king's robe type coat. And it needs to hang in the closet or the wardrobe or whatever they had back then. And, and just be you know, gotten out on special occasions. But instead, Joseph... Where is it every day? I mean, he just, he's 17 years old and he just kind of struts around in this coat every day, everywhere he's going. And, and uh, poor Joseph kind of, you know, we, we feel sorry for him a little bit because his father's not done him any favors. To be chosen the favorite son means that the other 10 boys are going to be your enemies, right? And that's what Jacob has done. And so they learn how to kind of despise and resent this young boy. And, I mean, they're shepherds, and so, you know, they're wearing Carhartt all day, and, and he is wearing his Armani, is, is just to put it in our day and age. He wears his Armani, and you can't watch the goats in your Armani, right? So he is immediately uh, set apart as being the supervisor, okay? The guy in the Armani has the corner office, and that's young 17-year-old Joseph and his older brothers are out working on the line and he is the supervisor. So it says that his brothers despise him. And you know, that's not the end of it. Joseph is a very gifted young man and it says that he's extremely handsome. This is just going to make it worse, right? He looks good in the coat. He wears it nice, you know? And can you imagine... Ten older brothers who look and act like they live with sheep and goats. And along comes this good-looking, well-dressed teenager who says that he hears things from God. Wow. I mean, and not only is he prophetic, but he lacks the wisdom on how to use these gifts. So here we are in Genesis 37, verses 6 and 7. This is Joseph. He said to them, listen to this dream I had. When we were binding stalks of grain in the field, my stalk got up and stood upright while your stalks gathered around it and bowed down to my stalk. Hmm. You can guess how that went over. You know, not, not real well. His brothers say, really? <laughs> you had that dream, did you? You had that dream where our stalks bowed down to you. Hmm. You're going to rule over us, boy? And we know it's not going to end well. I just love the fact, on the sidebar, I just love the fact the Bible doesn't edit this stuff out. I mean, this is good stuff. This is, a, this is one of the heroes. You know, Jacob is one of the heroes. Joseph is one of the heroes. And this is bad, okay? But we learn, and here's, here's a hint for you. As you're reading the Old Testament, the negative examples are usually the lessons. That's how you learn is by what not to do oftentimes in the Old Testament, not what to do. But here it is, just because, you know, he or we have this gift from God, and Joseph clearly did have a gift from God, his dream did come to pass, that doesn't mean that he or we 
will have the wisdom on how to use that. And then you see Joseph, I would say he's just full of himself. You, you know what that term means. He's, he's all about Joe. And he's, he's, not, he's not really ready to be used by God. He would have to go through some refining. God was going to use him to fulfill all these covenant promises. He was vital to the salvation, to the work of God, but he just wasn't ready to do that. So he has another dream, a dream that all 17-year-old boys have. Only this one's not about girls. This one has him as being the center of the universe. He sees himself as being the absolute center of the universe. And he sees 11 stars and the sun and the moon, and they're all revolving around him. It's verse 9 there in chapter 37. And he thinks it's wonderful, and he decides to share this with his dad and his brothers. <laughs> Good idea, right? Gee. He says, you'll never guess what I dreamed last night, Dad. <laughs> you know? I saw 11 stars and the sun and the moon, and they were all bowing down to me. Isn't that great? This is from God. Yeah. They didn't think it's so funny. They listen to him, you know, their mouths drop open, and they're absolutely astonished at his arrogance. I mean, how far is this boy going to go? Now he's telling his dad, you're going to bow down to me. Even his father's shocked. And his big mouth and his self-righteousness kind of brings things to a boil. His, his brothers are off in the field at Dotham, uh, you know, doing what shepherds do following the grass, and Joseph's father sends him on an errand. He's the supervisor, remember, young Joseph is. So he says, go out and check on your brothers. Make sure they're out there doing what shepherd boys do, you know, taking care of the sheep and the goats. And so he heads off, and here he is walking down the goat path, and his brothers see him, and one of them gets an idea. They say, let's kill him. Let's just kill him. The other ones go, that's a good idea. <laughs> Nobody will know we're out here. Nobody will see it. We'll, we'll get an end to this right now. You know, we have the opportunity. When he gets here, just surround him. We'll do what needs to be done. And they all say, yeah, let's do it. He deserves it. All of them but one, and that is Reuben. And Reuben is the oldest son. He's the one whose place Joseph has really taken. And, you know... Uh, Re Reuben's, Reuben has a little bit of compassion here, and he says, let's not kill him or harm him, but let's just throw him in a pit and leave him there. And the writer says he did that thinking he'd come back later and get him out of the pit. So we can imagine uh, the dialogue as they throw him in the pit and take his coat away from him. And, you know, Joseph's down there, and he goes... Hey, hey, guys, guys, you know, uh, okay, you made your point. All right, yeah, let me out. I won't tell Dad, right? You can keep the coat. I don't need the coat anymore. Guys, it's not funny. It's not funny anymore, guys. There's bugs down here. There's bugs. I'm feeling sick in my stomach, guys. You got any water? And the brothers, it says, they sat down after they threw him in the pit to eat lunch. And, you know, I kind of see him sitting there underneath the shade tree eating their pastrami on rye, right, with a, the big dill pickle, right? They're Jewish, right? They got to have pastrami on rye with a big dill pickle. And they say, shut up, Joey. We'll throw a snake down there with you, you know. And just then they see a caravan of... Um, Old weird Uncle Ishmael's uh, boys coming over the horizon, a camel caravan, and uh, they're, they're not really tight with old Ishmael too much, but um, they're slave traders. They're headed down to Egypt, and, and they think, well, let's get some money out of this. So uh, we'll sell a teenager. Those guys, they'll take him far away, and we'll never hear of him again, and that's what they do. And Joseph, you know, he's tied up with the rest of the slaves and led across the desert to Egypt while the brothers kill a goat, put the, the blood on the coat to take back to Jacob. Of course, he is just, it says, beside himself. He just can't get over it. And, uh, well, Jacob is, or excuse me, Joseph is 
walking on the, the wrong end of a camel all the way down to Egypt. From riches to rags in just one day, uh, Joseph goes from being the center of the universe to be a, a young man begging for his, wife, for his life. And he falls, um, as we see, from strength to weakness, just a few minutes, and there's no, nothing that he can do about it. He goes from being the favored son uh, of a man who, it says, all the nations of the world will be blessed through his father, Jacob, to being a young man with a rope around his neck in line with a bunch of other slaves going to who knows where. And here's, here's the truth in this. God is in this. God is in this fall. There's no doubt about it. See, God's given Joseph these dreams, and the dreams would become reality someday. And the time would come, if you know the story, when, when Joseph would rise to power to Egypt, would be the second man in Egypt. And his brothers and his father would come down there and he would preserve them. For 400 years, they would be in bondage in Egypt and then would get out under Moses' hands. That's next week. And God has gifted Joseph with the ability to see the future but God could not use him the way that he was, and God can't use us, any person, when we're so full of ourselves like Joseph was. God can only fill someone who's empty. And Joseph was just so full of himself that there was no room for God, so he had to be thrown into the pit and end up in slavery so God would use him in a way that even Joseph dreamed of being used. His failure is necessary absolutely necessary because he had not grown into a man with the character to match the gifts that God had given him. And man, what a common problem that is for us. Failure, I think, often is from God and it's necessary for God to bring about his covenant promises through us. Kingdom is about God using me for his purposes. Okay, and it's about how God uses God's covenant is going to be lived out. And Joseph was incapable of being used as long as it was all about him. My generation knew a guy named Chuck Colson. Uh, Chuck was uh, head counsel for Richard Nixon. Went down in the Water Watergate scandal. And uh, he was an extremely gifted, powerful man in Washington and in just, you know, a few months, it came about, and he was sent, convicted, sent to prison. And from prison, he emerged to be one of the strongest leaders and authors in the Christian community. And through him, uh, God used Chuck Colson to literally change millions of lives. Um, but it was a descent. It was a descent from riches into rags. And here's what he said about this. He said, The great paradox of my life is that every time I walk into a prison and see the faces of men or women who have been transformed by the power of the living God, I realize that the thing God has chosen to use in my life is none of the successes, achievements, degrees, awards, honors, or cases I won before the Supreme Court. That's not what God's using in my life. What God is using in my life to touch the lives of literally thousands of other people is the fact that I was a convict and went to prison. That was my great defeat, the only thing in my life I didn't succeed in, and that's what God used in Chuck Colson's life. It was God all along, you see. His fall, his failure. God was in the fall, his failure was used by God because God wanted to use him for his kingdom and he couldn't use Chuck Colson the way that he was. He had to become a broken man. Now, here's a word. I, I think this is from God. You're going to fail many more times in your life. You failed before. You will fail some more. You'll have some moral failures. Okay? You're going to have probably some financial failures. Failures where you don't perform adequately. Failures of competency. Failures of character. Many of these failures are going to be from God. Can you receive that? That God can use your failures? God will be pleased huh, that you fail. He will be pleased to see us fail because the failure will open the door 
And you will have the opportunity to move from the center of your universe out to the edge. We're going to fail at our relationships. You will never be everything that they need you to be. One primary cause of all of our failures is our gifts, the gifts that God has given to us, become the very things that we can't handle. Success will be too much for us. We won't be able to handle it. And we think the gifts and the abilities that we have, oh, these are our strength. No, our strength comes from God. And our brothers are going to throw us in the pit and they're going to put ropes around our necks and they're going to put us into slavery because God is in the fall. Joseph is taken to Egypt. And then it says the most amazing thing. Chapter 39, verse 2. It says, The Lord was with Joseph, and he became a successful man and served in his, in his Egyptian master's household. I'll just stop right there. The Lord was with Joseph. God sent him to Egypt. The Lord went down to Egypt with him. Right? God was in the fall. God went in with him into slavery. You see, the, the terms of the covenant never changed. He's still in covenant with God. That covenant was not broken, even though because of his failure. The terms of the covenant are completely, utterly reliable. And even though Jesus, Joseph has been taken to another land into captivity in chains and as a slave, it's the Lord that's with him. And it says that he's successful, or another translation says that he prospers. And that's, that's difficult for us to understand here. How could he be successful? Why is that successful down there as a slave? How could he prosper as a slave? And, and what this means, we think of prosperity of success to be all in terms of dollars and cents and public opinion. That's not what this means at all. What this means is when the God prospers us, when God gives us success, that there is always opportunity and access. There's always a road. There's always a way. No matter what pit we've been thrown into, there's always a way. That's what prosperity means with God. And Joseph understands little by little that God is with him because he sees his favor and his grace. There's always an opportunity for him. And it says he's down there as a slave, but he's prospering. God goes with him, with him into bankruptcy. God goes with him into divorce. God goes with us into unemployment. God goes with us into prison. God goes with us into public shame. God goes with us as we go from riches to rags. And there the covenant blessings are still intact. It says, and we prosper. We're the king's subjects in a foreign land, but he's still the king. And he owns the land. And Joseph... Remember, handsome Joseph. Well, he's in Potiphar's jail and he's serving, excuse me, not jail. He's in Potiphar's household and he's serving as a slave in Potiphar's uh, household. And Potiphar's wife, well, she was featured a couple times on Wives of Egypt, if that tells you anything. <laughs> you know the story. She says, he's cute. I like the Jew. Nice looking boy. Tries to trick him into a sexual relationship and, and he runs. There, there's a word for us in temptation. You just run. Just get out of there, right? And he runs away and she cries rape. Potiphar, he doesn't much believe it. He's got to do something. It's his wife. But if Potiphar believed that it was rape, Joseph would have been dead. No doubt about it. Potiphar doesn't buy it, so he throws him into his jail right there in his house household. But right there as Joseph is starting to get back on his feet, you see, down he goes again. So Joseph is put into to Potiphar's uh, jail and still he's there at the household of Potiphar and he becomes the trustee of the jail. <laughs> God, God is with him. He prospers, right? And he's prospering even in this place of extreme captivity. And he came as a slave and now he's a prisoner and now he's a prisoner and a slave. Okay. But the Lord blesses him, it says, and he has prosperity even in captivity. There's always a way up. That's what God is saying. Now, what's, what's God wanting to do here? Why all this stuff, you know? 
God's wanting to do something in Joseph's heart that allows the blessing of his life to be released to others. He's trying to make Joseph into a vessel that he can really use. And some great things he has planned. Some great things come about. And the thing in his heart that he wants to do in his heart and in our heart is the very thing that's necessary for us to be effective in his kingdom. He wants to move Joseph from the center of the universe to its edge. Okay? And slowly, Joseph is moving from being the center uh, to a position where God is in the center. But it doesn't get there easily, does it? It's, it's not just a, oh, I get it, I'll move to the edge. While in captivity, living as a servant, Joseph comes to his real identity. He's not a young, attractive, gifted man. He's a covenant partner of God Almighty. And he's got to get off the throne. He's been sitting on the throne in his life and saying, Lord, you want to help me? <laughs> we've all been there. We may be there today. I'm on the throne. God, would you help me? That we've got a relationship. God helps me stay on my throne, right? And God says, no, that's, that's not going to work for what I want to do with you. Okay, I want to do bigger things than that. So the year goes by. Joseph becomes more and more like God, and he takes on the identity and the character of his covenant partner, and he becomes humble. And as he does, God begins to use him more and more. So Joseph's still there in prison, and these two characters arrive. There's, something's happened up at Pharaoh's household because his butler and his baker end up down there in the prison. The baker makes the food, the butler tastes the food, so Pharaoh doesn't get poisoned. And something's happened up there because they both end up down there in jail. And they have a dream, and they, you know, they go, wow, we've had this dream, but we don't have the slightest idea what this means. So Joseph's there, you know, the dreamer. And Genesis 40, verse 8, we'll just drop in there again. They answered, we've both had dreams, but there's no one to interpret them. And Joseph said to them, don't interpretations belong to God? Describe your dreams to me. He's been in prison 11 years, okay? He's 28 now. Eh, start starting to get a little bit of wisdom, age 28. And there's just enough room at the center of his life for himself and God. So I kind of picture a great big throne, and they're both trying to squeeze in the throne. You know, God's, God's sitting there with him, and they're just kind of all scrunched up in that throne. You get that picture? Yeah. We get to that point, and people think, oh, they're a really dedicated Christian. <laughs> they're really a dedicated Christian. You know, Jesus and, and they're, they're just right there together. Don't interpretations belong to God? You know, it's no longer, you see, all about him. Now it's about God. But tell me the dream. 11 years of prison, that'll do that for you. So they tell him the dream. It's good news for one of them, not so good for the other. Butler returns to Pharaoh. The baker loses his head. And two more years pass, and Pharaoh has some dreams, and you guessed it, uh, who offers Joseph to come interpret them, but the butler that's there. And so they, Pharaoh uh, asks all of his magicians and his uh, soothsayers and all the stargazers and all those guys, and they you know, look at the eight ball and the Ouija board. They got it out, and they got no idea what's going on. I'm just kidding there about the eight ball and the Ouija boards, guys. But anyway... They, they, they summon Joseph to the court in chapter 41, 15 and 16. I love this passage. Pharaoh said to Joseph, I had a dream, but no one could interpret it. Then I heard that when you hear a dream, you can interpret it. Joseph answered Pharaoh, it's not me. <laughs> God will give Pharaoh a favorable response. Wow. It's not me. Some other translations say it a little bit differently. Some of them, I think NIV says, I can't do it. 13 years. He's 30 years old. All right, Been in jail for 13 years. He finally gets to, I can't do it. God can do it. Does this mean that Joseph has lost his skills or at interpreting dreams? No. Does it mean that he has lost his anointing from God? No. Does it mean that he has suddenly lost his confidence? No. What's happened is this. Through the fall, through this journey of humility, of descending down 
Okay, Joseph has moved from the center of his universe out to the edge and given God his rightful place on the throne. I can't do it. I cannot do it. God's still going to give the interpretation through him to Pharaoh. See, God has made room for himself in the life of Joseph. Well, that's the end for today. Do you see what God wants to do in our hearts? Do you see what God wants to do in our lives? He, he, wants, he wants to you know, use us to heal the sick, to touch people that are broken, to help his people in this world. But he can't do it if it's all me. He can't even do it if it's just me and God. All right? This, this, is, this is a difficult, difficult journey. If you want to be your life to be a conduit for the kingdom of God, if you, if you want your heart to be the door where the future that God has stored up breaks out, all that future breaks out for other people through you, then you have to move from the center of your world. Will you get there today? I don't think so. Maybe some of you are close. I don't know. It's, it's not an easy journey. It's, it's oftentimes painful. Humiliating. Humiliation is not a bad thing. If, if God is the upside of it, see. But what I want us to do is to begin to reframe some of the things that have happened to us and some of the things maybe that people have done to us. You, you know, it, it, was, it was Potiphar's wife that trapped him. He had done nothing wrong. He was unjustly accused. And sometimes that's the way we fall, is by someone else. And sometimes it's just our own arrogance and our own immaturity and, and, and lack of wisdom that gets us into it. But if, if we could see that God is trying to make a place in our lives for himself so he could fulfill the covenant promises that he wants to do through us. Okay. If we won't receive it, it'll never happen. If we're going to fight it, if we're going to blame other people and other things, it'll never happen. Which, which takes me back to John 15, 5. Jesus says, I'm the vine, you're the branches. If, re if you remain in me and I in you, then you will produce much fruit. Without me, you can't do anything. Every day I find myself in the center of my world. I wake up every morning on the throne. I don't think I'm weird. I think I'm like pretty much a normal person in that. But what about you? For a minute. Uh, we think... You see, uh, we think of the kingdom of God as being power and authority and transformation, and it is, but uh, for that to happen through us, and only God can make room in us. Let's, let's just sit with that for a minute. As deep cries out